Welcome to another episode of Outside Ourselves. I'm your host, Kelsey Clumbera. Today, my guest is author and writer, Ashley Landy. We are talking about her forthcoming book, The Thing That Would Make Everything Okay. This is a book that is about Ashley's journey from New Age religion and using psychedelics to Christianity. And it was an amazing conversation. I can't wait for you to listen to it. We talk a lot about uh, works righteousness, what that looks like within the new age lifestyle and what that looks like for everyone. The temptation for even Christians to place our righteousness, not in Christ, but in our works and what we do and in the law. Honestly, I think that this is a conversation that even though we didn't ever use the words is such an amazing contrast between uh, what theology of glory looks like and what happens when you are actually confronted with a theology of the cross with Christ crucified for your sins and the fact that that is not something that we are in charge of or can in control of that it is completely and totally a gift given to us and the amazing relief that comes from trusting in that from the trust that is given to us by the Holy Spirit in Christ's work for us on the cross with that here is today's conversation Ashley, thank you so much for joining me today on Outside Ourselves. I'm so excited to talk about your forthcoming book, which is coming out um, this fall. Can you, as we get started, just give us a little bit about who you are, uh, what you do, where you're from, all of that, that kind of information? Sure. Yeah. Well, I'm a writer and an artist. This is my first published book, though. And um, I live in rural Kansas with my family. I have three children. My husband and I have three children. And I um, I grew up, let's see, in kind of a with kind of a Methodist upbringing. And we're currently at kind of a Baptist non denominational church. And I was an atheist. Declared myself an atheist when I was fourteen, fifteen. And I started getting into psychedelic drugs when I was 22, I believe. And that for years thereafter, that was my religion, that along with this new age um, belief systems, it was just kind of a grab bag, free for all <laughs> of whatever. Okay. And I was yeah. very, very into yoga and meditation. And then I encountered Jesus when I was probably think 30 years old, 29, 30 years old, and I became a Christian. So. Amazing. Um, that is, that's really the story of your book and your book has an amazing title. It's called the thing that would make everything okay forever. Uh, and it also has an amazing cover. Your cover is actually what I was like browsing Lexum's um, page. And I was like, oh my gosh, what is that book about? It's so, <laughs> so cool. In your book, you're telling your story of, of conversion and kind of this journey from being an avid user of psychedelics to Christianity. I'm curious why you decided uh, to tell this story. Why did you, why did you feel like it was a story that people needed to read and hear about? You know, for a long time after I quit using psychedelics, I kind of felt so scarred and damaged by my years of psychedelic use mm -hmm. that I really didn't, I just didn't want to have anything to do with that world. I didn't really want to talk about it. Um, the church we started attending when we became Christians, when we still lived in Kansas City, Missouri, I don't, re I didn't really share my story with anyone. It just didn't really even occur to me. I just was so profoundly relieved <laughs> to be done mm -hmm. with all that and to be to be done with assailing my mind with chemicals for so many years in pursuit of the thing that would make everything okay forever. Now that I had encountered Jesus, I just wanted to push all of that so far away from me. And, and I think the Lord really um, worked a lot of healing in me for, for years afterward. I would still have flashbacks even up to three, four years afterward. I would wake up in the middle of the night and just be feel like I was full on tripping on LSD, which oh, wow. was really upsetting. It was really upsetting yeah. at first, but I found that I found that I could just call in the name of Jesus 
and it mm. would stop, which was a really amazing experience. And so for a long time, I just didn't even, like I said, I didn't even want to talk about it. I didn't really want to think about it. And then several years ago, I was reading an essay in Ecstasis magazine, actually, which it now is um, published by Christianity Today. And okay. it was a woman writing about, she was actually writing about another writer. Her name was Rachel Co. And she was writing about, um, gosh, the name escapes me right now, um, another writer a female writer who had written an essay for, gosh, I think the New Yorker maybe, where she chronicled how she, her evangelical upbringing and how she actually left Christianity in part through her use of psychedelics. Hmm. And um, this writer in Ecstasis was kind of reflecting on her article and her essay. And, and um, I thought, so I went and then I went and read that essay in the New Yorker, the original essay. And I thought, gosh, like I, I have the opposite <laughs> trajectory and I thought yeah. maybe I should, maybe I should write about that. And so I wrote an essay just kind of summarizing my journey, my conversion story. And I submitted it to Fathom magazine and it was accepted and published. So that was kind of the, the beginning of, of mm -hmm. me thinking, gosh, I could, maybe this is a story that needs to be, to be told. And another huge factor was that I was noticing a huge resurgence in interest in psychedelics culturally. Um, yeah. And a lot of your listeners may notice like it's everywhere. And yeah. I just thought, um, I thought nobody, and sometimes if I did, if I ever did mention my story to fellow Christians, people who don't have any prior experience with psychedelics, they just t kind of tend to lump them in with other drugs like cocaine, heroin, yeah. and which all those drugs are, terribly destructive, but I feel like psychedelics do kind of have a unique element in that people who use them, I know I, when I use them, I completely spiritualized my drug use. <laughs> you know, I, I mm -hmm. wasn't a druggie, like I was a spiritual seeker and psychedelics to me were exceptional from other street drugs. And so I just started realizing from all these angles, like this is a story that needs to be told. I don't really hear any other Christians. Like you can find um, testimonies of lots of Christians from the 60s and 70s who joined yeah. the Jesus People Movement and were former hippies and came mm -hmm. out of that. But I didn't really see any, uh, so many contemporary or really any contemporary stories like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, I definitely know of people who have left the church in pursuit of psychedelics as well. And I'm curious, I, I don't know the New Yorker piece you're talking about, but what have you for that, for that crowd? And maybe it's not even just the people that are leaving the church for it, but what are people seeking um, in, in that? And then maybe, maybe a follow-up for those who, you know, this piece you mentioned in the New Yorker, what was she exactly like, what what was the reason that she gave? I'm just, I'm curious of why she, she left the church and found that that was the decision she needed, needed to make. Yeah. And I'm so sorry. I wish I could remember the name of that writer. I, I think okay. the, name, the name of the piece, I think was just ecstasy. And I'm okay. pretty sure it was the New Yorker. It was either the New Yorker or the Atlantic, but I think it was the New Yorker. And, um, I haven't read it in a few years, but if my memory serves me, it wasn't necessarily the psychedelics that she was already moving away from her evangelical upbringing. Yeah. I think a lot of it seems political, like uh, not one, no longer wanting to identify with conservative theology and conservative political views. So that was part of it. And I, the way she was, she wrote beautifully. I mean, I, I disagreed with her, but right, she wrote, yeah, wrote beautifully. And when she wrote about the experience of taking ecstasy and BMA, and then taking LSC, it was um, she really captured the seductive nature of it. It's very enchanting, mm -hmm. and I certainly experienced mm -hmm. that too. You know, there's a reason people take drugs, and in particular mm -hmm. psychedelics. Some people have a bat horrible trip right off the bat, and they never touch them again, but it's very enchanting and very, so I think um, a lot of times people are looking for an experience of transcendence, an experience mm -hmm. that I, I mean, I, I thought I had experienced 
the presence of God on psychedelics. And I had never, I had never felt that before. I grew up in, like I said, I grew up in um, a Methodist tradition that was very, um, how can I put it? Like de-emphasize the supernatural, de-emphasize yeah. the, the mystical. Um, it was a lot of, um, yeah, just like, like I said, de-emphasize the supernatural and the mystical. So yeah. I think a lot of people, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for something deeper. They're looking for transcendence. They're looking for an experience that feel, even if it's counterfeit or it's not authentic, it, it feels authentic. It feels real. It feels spiritual. It feels transcendent. Hmm. That's so interesting. Even if you don't even if you're not talking about God as experience, because I think that can sometimes get dangerous. Sure. Um, but when you don't talk about God as so big and powerful and, you know, all consuming and all around us, like, and in our, and also in our daily lives, um, I think that that it makes it feel, it makes Christianity really hollow. Yes. Yeah. I completely agree. And I think there's, you know, in some, some Christian denominations, there's a little bit of a fear of like, well, we don't want to, we don't want to tread into that. Like you said, and like you said, it can be dangerous, but we don't want to tread into that, that category of mysticism. So we're not going mm -hmm. to, you know, and I found when I first became a Christian, I was really attracted to Pentecostalism just because it is more mm -hmm experience experiential and I was also when we were kind of we were just kind of trying things out in the beginning and we went to an eastern orthodox liturgy and mm. I did find there I felt like there was more of an appreciation for and an honoring of the mystery of God and ultimately like I said we didn't become eastern orthodox but but I I felt like there was more of an honoring of that and in some Christian denominations there tends to be a I don't know what to call it, like a, it's kind of a shying away from that for, for, for fear that we're going to tread into dangerous ter territory. But then as yeah. you said, we also neglect, I mean, it's clear in scripture, like God does speak to people through dreams. Sometimes God does, you know, mm -hmm. speak in these different ways. And of course we have to test all of that, you know, test the spirits and test all of that against scripture. But but the reality is that that does happen. And I think mm -hmm. we completely ignore and neglect that at peril of having people seek transcendence in the in the wrong places and in places that are truly dangerous. I think um, I think it's interesting. It seems like one of the issues that comes up when mysticism or experience or or an experience of the transcendent is emphasized um and i think this is true broadly but then obviously also this happens in christianity i think where it goes wrong is when it's it becomes a thing that we have to we are like discovering or we're in we're in control really right like we are in um we are in control of finding and obtaining righteousness in some way on our own. Yeah. Um, that's, I think that that's when it becomes dangerous and maybe it's just that, but what's funny is that that happens, that happens in any type of work in or, or outside of the church. Like that happens in churches where there is an, more of an emphasis on head knowledge as well. Cause all of a sudden salvation sure. is equated with knowing God and knowing God really well. But right. all that to say, I think that that's something that you, you wrote so clearly about that it seemed like, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but it seemed like that that's kind of was a big, a draw for you in psychedelics that it was like kind of this unfolding of, higher knowledge or even like secret knowledge like there was almost it seems like a little bit of gnosticism there where you were you felt like if you could just get to this point mm -hmm. you would find some something you would know something that um either people either people didn't know or few knew or something like that is that true do you think that that was a big draw for you oh absolutely yeah i had a very uh huge prejudice against anything, you know, I wanted to know 
if, if it was esoteric, if it was secret, if it was hidden, you know, if it was arcane, mm. like I was interested in it. Whereas I, I wouldn't even look at, and like I said, I did grow up with something of a Christian foundation, but I never really, I don't know. I just, I never really had an understanding of the gospel. I never really had, you know, and and so I was very drawn. I, I thought, oh, I'm not even going to look at, I was, the irony is that I was open to anything, literally anything. I mean, mm. I had a friend who was really into the idea that dolphins were a superior alien intelligence and just all kinds of, nothing was too wacky. Nothing was too far out. Nothing was too implausible, I, but I would not entertain the idea of Christianity because in my head, I was like, I already know what that's all about. And it's, it, that can't be the truth because it's, it's so well known, you know, I mean, it's arg arguable whether the gospel is actually that well known, but, but it's so, yeah, it's, so, it's for anyone, you know, it's, it's too for simple. Anyone. Yeah. Yeah. It's too simple. And, and I think there was an arrogance in there too, of like, which it was, I was so like, God humbled me in such a beautiful way when I realized that the, the gospel was the truth. And that all these people that I looked down on as be not being as, you know, knowledgeable as I was, as not having this secret hidden knowledge that I felt had been vouchsafed to me through psychedelics, they were actually onto the truth the whole time, you know? Hmm. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was thinking too, because yeah. you, you mentioned um, juicing and crystals and all these practices, There, there is very much a it is very much like a works religion going on, like a, a self yeah. salvation thing going on. Like I was absolutely obsessed. And I think I wrote about this a little bit in the book. I, at one point I became absolutely obsessed with health food and yeah. eating, you know, not eating any sugar, not let my, letting my kids eat any sugar. Like I felt like, and I, I wouldn't have articulated it this way at the time, but there was definitely an underlying belief that if I can, if I can, perfectly control what goes into my body and I can buy all the green powders and the supplements and that I can somehow save myself through, mm -hmm. through what I am consuming. And so it was really, that was another thing. It was really um, just humbling, I guess. And, and not, not that health isn't important, but now I can put it in its right place and reading, you know, what Jesus said about like, it's not what goes into your body that makes you clean. It what it's what comes out of you. It's what's in your heart. And I was like, mm. Oh, wow. Like, yeah. 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 No, I, that part of the book was so amazing. Like that, the whole story that you tell, and I don't want to ruin it for people because I want them to read, read it themselves, but about the midwife and the, oh, yes. um, that retreat was like so amazing and, and crazy. I think really for the 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 main reason it sticks out to me is that when you for me at least when i think of like the use of psychedelics or you know um people who have uh are, are drawn to maybe more of like the wellness movement or something you i don't think i necessarily first think of oh those people are like rule followers like they're really into the rules yeah. but you wrote like that rules were your God. And so I think it's a really interesting example that shows that everyone has a rule book. Oh, yeah. Like everyone has these laws, even Christians, I would argue, even though we know Christians know and trust that we aren't saved by the rule book, we still functionally struggle to not be saved by whatever sort of law that we are, um, we are chasing after, but everyone has a, a rule book, even like the probably the most hippie person that you know, like you are ascribing to some form or some ideal that you're trying to reach. I thought that that was really, really interesting. Yeah. And that's absolutely true. Like some of the most dogmatic people I knew and, and myself were, you know, hippie to be new age people. And it's, it's, a. Uh, I feel like it all, and it all traces back to the, I guess the original temptation to be like God yeah. and to save ourselves, yes. to save ourselves. Mm -hmm. Like I, I earnestly, like I said, I wouldn't, if someone had tried to confront me with that at the time, I think I would deny it, but it was all like a self salvation scheme. It's like, if I can just, you know, for a long time, it was like, if I can just 
take psychedelics with the right intention, if I can have the right kind of ceremonial trappings around my psychedelic trips, if I can meditate enough, if I can practice enough yoga, if I can eat the right things, like all these things, you know, I really thought I was saving myself. Like I was earning my salvation somehow. Like I would, Mm. um, yeah. And obviously it just, and of course the irony with anything like that is you get, you get farther and farther, farther away from what you think you're, you're going to attain. And it's, it's so disheartening and and so sorrowful. And so it was such a, such a profound relief. I can't even, you know, I I can't even describe the, the profound relief of realizing that I couldn't save myself. And that I, I didn't have to because Jesus was my savior hmm. and it was just so beautiful. But like you said, I feel like we always are tempted into different iterations of that, but it's just fascinating. Yeah. yeah in the, in the new age world, these, you know, you think these people are just laid back hippies, but like you said, everyone has a system of salvation. Everyone has a system of rules that that they're striving to live by and straining to live by thinking that it's going to get them somewhere that it's going to earn them something that it's going to save them essentially Mm. yeah yeah Yeah, it's amazing and i think just one more thing on that note you you wrote this too which i really struck me you said um at some point i wanted to i wanted god or further i wanted to be god or at least merge completely with god and that just made me think of um there's this Lutheran theologian, Gerhard Ferdi, and he's kind of writing on the coattails of Luther himself, but he okay. says that the real seed of sin is not in the flesh, but in our spiritual aspirations. And really mm-hmm. what he's saying there and talking about is the fact that not only do we want to save ourselves, but we actually want to be God. Like that is the original sin yeah. is that Adam and Eve thought like yeah. they they could save themselves because they were God. They're, we're, we're so actually offended by the fact that we aren't the creator himself um, and are trying to subvert him. Um, I'm curious your thoughts on that and kind of if you would, if you would be willing to talk more about your experience with that um, in and of itself, since you wrote a little bit about it. Yeah, absolutely. And I absolutely think the temptation to be God is so wrapped up in psychedelic use. I mean, you feel like Mm -hmm. you're getting all of this secret knowledge that you're traveling into realms, all these supernatural realms. But the the terrible thing is that you get so much more than you bargained for. I really feel like Mm -hmm. there's some, and I've talked to, I have um, one of the really wonderful things about beginning to write and talk about this is that I did have all these people reach out to me saying, hey, you know, my story is really similar. I was super into psychedelics and now I'm a Christian. And so I have um, a couple of friends that I speak to on a regular basis, and we all agree that there's, there, we feel like there's something analogous between psychedelics and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Like you, hmm. it's so enchanting. It looks so good to eat, you know, it looks so appealing. And so you take a bite and you end up getting so much more than you bargained for. I, I've, I've said before, I feel like a really bad trip on psychedelics is a, a trauma that the hu- that we are not designed to bear. Like it's a hmm. it's a horrible experience, absolutely horrible. And there are people who, of course, you know the current promoters of psychedelics downplay this or don't acknowledge it at all. There are people who do not come back from psychedelics. And so <laughs> I, when you know, I should be on my knees thanking God every day that I that He restored me to a reasonably sound mind after my many years of psychedelic use because there are people who are not restored in this life. And it's, it's incredibly tragic. And yeah. I'm so thankful for that. But I, I absolutely, yeah, I, I mean, you hit the nail on the head, like the, the temptation to want to be like God and to know what God knows and, yeah. and to have this secret esoteric knowledge that, that we're not, we're not meant to bear at all. And I, yeah. um, I can't remember, I think maybe John Owen, there was a Puritan who, who originated the phrase, um, that Satan shows the bait and hides the hook. And that's, hmm. that's so true with psychedelics. Like I said, that, yeah. that those first, those initial experiences can be so enchanting. It's like, and the word pharmakia in the Bible, a, a lot of people believe that that, and I believe too, that that refers to not only witchcraft and sorcery, but also the use of drugs to attain hmm. different states of consciousness. 
And there is something like when I, when that clicked for me, I thought it, that makes so much sense because it's like psychedelics cast a spell over people. It really oh, is. Yeah. There really is something to that. It's, and yeah. I just, I remember I was so, I almost had this, um, Stockholm syndrome with psychedelics, even after I started having bad trips and I couldn't get the same high. And th that is, you know, it was humbling too, to realize I'm not any better than a heroin addict or a cocaine mm. addict, because it's like, I'm chasing and chasing this high and I can't get it anymore, but I still mm. keep going back. And there was almost like this Stockholm syndrome where I felt like, um, you know, looking back, I would have said, oh, I'm, I'm encountering God through psychedelics, but actually the psychedelics had become my God in a sense. They had become my, my captor. Like I was captive to them. Yeah. And I, I, even though I was have I started having, you know, bad experiences over the years, I just kept going back because I felt like, I felt like I had to. I'm curious if you could talk a little bit more because you write a lot about not only, you know, what these bad trips were like and the effects of that, but like how psychedelics kind of informed your view of the world at large, like relationships, what it, what it did to how you uh, experience those. And then, um, yourself, like uh, we've talked a little bit about that probably, but, um, even reality itself, like how you just went about your day to day. And I think that that's kind of part of that spell. Um, perhaps I'm, I'm curious if you could, if, if you could talk a little bit about that and the effects that, um, it had just on your day to day life. Yeah, sure. So psychedelics, I believe that they make you very inward oriented. You believe that you're on this spiritual journey and even people who, you know, might trip with other people, which I did sometimes trip with other people. And then when I met my husband, we actually met at our acid dealer's house. Um, you're still on this interior journey and what you experience the, even if you're with someone or a group of people, they're not experiencing the same thing as you are. And so there's, um, and within the, you know, the circles I ran, the new age and yoga circles, there was a lot of language around, um, well, a lot of language around, and that's kind of derived from Buddhism, I guess, controlling your thoughts and thinking only right thoughts and um, hmm. having only right actions. And also this language around like, you're, you're working on yourself. And it almost becomes this very like, solipsistic worldview where everyone else is serving your enlightenment, you know, whether it's mm. a negative interaction with someone or positive, like everyone else is kind of like, um, how can I put it? Like, uh, spurring you towards your point of enlightenment. So it becomes yeah, like a tool, right? Almost. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so I, looking back, I can see how that kind of thinking, um, negatively affected my relationships and, you also, I mean, there's another aspect, especially when I was tripping a lot by myself, um, prior to meeting my husband, I had this, I mean, I was losing my mind. Like I had this entire worldview built up around my psychedelic use and the trips that I'd had and the experiences that I had that no one else could possibly understand. And I could never even translate it to someone. Yeah. And it was a very dangerous place psychologically, very scary. Um, and so, yeah, I think psychedelics really, they really warp people's perspectives. They really warp people's perspectives. And I also think it's curious and very interesting to think of like, you know, the spiritual forces that are working through psychedelics that almost um, very reliably, they lead people to a kind of a pantheistic worldview. And I think mm -hmm. that pantheism ultimately is is kind of another side of the coin with nihilism like hmm. it's not really if I it and it really struck me after once I had children I realized that and I wrote about this a little bit in the book that I realized we well we had a friend who at the time who gave us a children's book that he bought from the unity village bookstore unity Unity churches, I think they're they're national, but they originated in a suburb of Kansas City. And so he gave us, yeah, he gave us, we were really into going to Unity Village to take psychedelics for a long time. And um, it's a strange, strange place. Very beautiful, like these Spanish style tiled buildings, but it's, it's strange. <laughs> I wrote about that a bit in the book. So, um, but yeah, so I was gifted this children's book that essentially 
took this highfalutin language about, you know, we are all one, we are all everything, we are all God. And, and when you put it down and, you know, you can dress it up. Like I used to love um, Alan Watts. He was a philosopher from the 50s, 60s. That was really big um, in the psychedelic world then. And it's still pretty a pretty big deal in the psychedelic world now. And you can, he was very, he was a very gifted um, orator and very good at making things sound really f- philosophically sophisticated. But mm. when I read this, those same philosophies, brought down to the level of writing in a children's book, it just <laughs> struck me like, this is so perverse. It, the book literally said it was narrated by a child and it said like, you know, I am the blocks at my feet. I am the puppy across the street. Like still talking about how like I am a part <laughs> of everything. And I, I just, when it, when it was expressed that way, I just, it was, I mean, it was on one hand, it was so stupid, but it was also horrifying to me because I'd look at my, huh. my toddler son and I would think he's now almost 15. And I would think, but I don't, I don't want him to be absorbed back into the all when he dies. Like he is him. Yeah. Like he, he is, um, sorry, it, just, <laughs> it strikes my heart. Like he yeah. is wonderfully and fearfully made, which is not a phrase I would have used at the time, but um, I, and I, I loved him so much and I, it, it, it tore my heart apart to think of like that he's, he's only, you know, r- arises as this illusion of a unique creation for, for a time, a brief, mm-hmm. a brief time. And then he's going to be absorbed back into the all, like everything is, and I'm supposed to be happy about that. <laughs> like, you know, That's, yeah, yeah, Man. yeah, yeah. That, that connection to between pantheism and nihilism is so interesting. I've never heard that before, Mm -hmm. but just having you explain that makes total sense. And I think that is uh, fascinating that seeing that language distilled down to, you know, as what simply could be expressed to a child kind of reveals it for what it is. Like there's no, there's no longer any window dressing around it. It's like, no, you are. (laughs) <laughs> the right. blocks of, yeah, I'm the blocks of my feet. I mean, that's just incredible. And yeah, yeah, there is, there's no, there's such a, um, talk about the antithesis to everything will be okay someday. Yes. Like there's no hope in that, no. yeah. in that worldview at all. Yeah. No. Nope. Yeah. It seems like, to me, it seemed like at least a shift kind of came for you when you had kids Do you think that that is the, the case and what, well, we, I think we've, we've kind of talked about like what that, that shift was like, was there anything else that you felt like at that time was really, um, kind of changing? I want to get to, you know, how you guys, um, kind of started to pursue Christianity or ask some questions, but curious if at that time, like just with small children, how your, your worldview was changing, how you were changing, um, and, and what impact that had on, on your view of psychedelics. There was a childhood friend that I had named Carrie, who I had lost touch with. And then we kind of reconnected when we both had children and I, well, we kind of reconnected a little bit in college. She had sent an email out to, um, to me and then some of the other mutual friends that we had had ran around in this little group in middle school. And I thought it was like the hokiest thing I had ever read. It was all about how, like how she met her husband and how God started moving in her life and God did this and God did that. And I just was rolling my eyes the whole time thinking this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever read. And, um, and then a few years after that, when we, but once we both had children, we reconnected and, and she would have me over to her house for play dates or she would come over to my house. And I knew that she was a Christian, but I just thought, you know, like I said, I was kind of rolling my eyes at if she would mention things from the Bible or if she would mention, you know, even, even invoke the name of the, like the Lord or Jesus. I would just kind of, I just had this very, um, knee jerk aversion to any talk of Jesus. And now I can look back and see, yeah. I'm sure that was largely su- supernatural, you know, but she, and, and then once I slowly started kind of exploring Christianity, I was very resistant at first. My husband, he had also gotten to the end of himself basically. Mm. And he was just, and he had started seeing a psychologist and the psychologist therapist said, challenged him to quit smoking marijuana every day and to go to church. So 
all of this was kind of happening around the same time. And I remember I would, when I would meet up with my friend Carrie just once every couple months, I would bring up something about, I was reading, of course I, you know, initially I was like, well, I'm not going to read scripture. I'm, I'll read books about Christianity or books about, <laughs> yeah. and I, I, someone recommended Rob Bell to me. And so I got at him for a while. And I remember I was telling her about this thing I had read in a Rob Bell book and she kind of, um, she has like a very, very gentle and patient way about her. And so she wouldn't mm -hmm. react like, oh my gosh, that's blasphemy. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. she would say, she would just say like, well, um, the Bible says this, you know, and hmm. she would just rattle off a Bible verse off the top of her head. And I would just be like, okay, well, whatever. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> but she had just, like I said, such a, such a patient, non-reactive way of responding yeah. to me. And she, they had a, so now they have, yeah, they have five children, but they had, um, so she had a son a, a little bit older than my son. And then she had, um, a baby girl who was, um, maybe like, so Cameron was four and Joella, her name was Joella. She was two and mm -hmm. she started to have just some like ran really random symptoms one day and they, you know, they waited a, a week or so. Cause sometimes, you know, how it is your kids just get a virus right. or they get, and um, they weren't going away. So they, they took her in and they started running tests. Um, she was diagnosed with leukemia and she died. Mm -hmm. and yeah. so, so she died three, okay. weeks, three weeks later. And um, <sighs> it was, I mean, just devastating, just yeah. horrible. And I remember going to the funeral and I was actually about six, seven, eight weeks pregnant with my daughter hmm. and, um, just, you know, just like sobbing, weeping over it. And, um, they had an open casket and she looked so beautiful, Joella. She just looked like a doll. And hmm. I, it, it had, I think the biggest effect honestly was, I, I realized like my worldviews and my beliefs and my ideology, I did not have a framework for dealing with this. You know, yeah. I didn't have, there was nothing comforting about my <laughs> belief system that, mm. that, that could even account for this. And yeah. like I said, you know, that, that, that book that I had, you know, thinking, oh, this, you know, she's being absorbed back into the all, like she's being, it just, none of it made any sense. And also witnessing my friend and her husband, they were, of course they were, they were devastated. They were heartbroken, yeah. but, but they weren't like completely destroyed. Yeah. And I think just seeing that and being like, um, something is sustaining them, you know, something yeah. sustaining mm -hmm. them and I don't have it, whatever sustaining them, I don't have it. And, um, that had a really, really profound effect on me. I guess just watching them suffer horribly, something that I can't even imagine, but like suffer, um, with grace and suffer, suffer with hope. I yeah. just couldn't imagine how I could do that. I, like I said, I just didn't have any beliefs that could have sustained me through a tragedy like that. And I emailed back and forth a little with Carrie after, a few months after Joella passed. And she told me at one point that the hymn, it is well with my soul was mm -hmm. really a blessing to them as they were grieving. And, um, of course the story behind that is the, the songwriter, uh, the hymn writer lost, I think like four daughters at sea. That's it was right. just, yes. um, just unfathomable tragedy. Yeah. And, and so I had never even really heard that hymn before. And I remember I put it on a playlist and I kind of forgot about it. And then one spring day, um, it must have been, yeah, after my daughter was born because she was maybe six months old and my son was playing, we were on the front porch and I had opened the window uh, to my house and I was sitting there and I, I put that playlist on and that song came wafting through the screen and I hadn't even really been paying attention to whatever the music that was playing. And I remember I, all of a sudden, like, it was just like the Holy spirit, like clicked my attention on and I started listening mm -hmm. and, and the lyrics just hit me so profoundly. And like I said, it was just this, 
this confluence of all these things happening at once, me realizing that my worldview was completely insufficient to account for tragedy. It was completely insufficient to account for, for the love that I felt for my children. And, and that was kind of like just the perfect, um, I hate to call it the perfect storm because it wasn't a storm, but it's like the perfect, like God had just orchestrated this perfect confluence of events. And that was the day where I really just all of a sudden through the lyrics of that hymn, I I realized it was like everything just fell into place. I realized Hmm. um, what the gospel meant. Like I realized Hmm. uh, that that my sin was nailed to the cross and, and I bore it no more that he took yeah. it all. Like I realized what Jesus did for me and, hmm. and it was so beautiful. And, and like I said, such a, such a relief from all yeah. the, the self salvation schemes that I had been chasing for so many years. And so I remember that day when my husband came home from work, we still had some little, um, Oh gosh, different like Buddhist Buddha figurines. And I had Ganesh, the elephant God from, Hinduism. And I had a, I had a little icon, which I now looking back, I can't believe I had this on my wall when my toddler was looking around, having to see it, but a, a, a Hindu icon of the goddess Kali who has like mm. a garland of human heads and she's holding human heads and there's blood dripping from her mouth. And, <laughs> you know, I had this whole, this whole thing, like I could kind of been introduced to her through my yoga practice. And I had this, you know, the whole thing around, like, she's the spiritualized thing. Like she's the destroyer. Cause you have to destroy certain things in yourself and your life. And, and destruction yeah. is destruction yeah. is just part of creation. You know, it's just the yin and yang of creation. And, um, and I, I immediately, that just seemed so obscene to me. I was like, it, it it's like a, it's like a demon. How is that a God? Yeah. <laughs> and so, yeah. And so when my husband got home from work, I remember just saying like, I just want to get rid of all this stuff. I'm done with it. And he, he completely agreed. And so hmm. we just threw it all in the trash bag and threw it away. And so that was really, yeah, that was really a, a turning point. I feel like that was really my, if I can point to a, a moment that I was saved, that I was converted, that would, that would probably be it. That was it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's amazing. I love so much of that story. You're like your friend basically sharing the gospel with you just by I think stating scripture and not giving you anything else. I think that that's such an amazing thing. I've heard, I've actually heard that from a few other people I've interviewed, like that that had an impact on them. One, one guy was like in a, a Christian cult of sorts and a friend um, very gently confronted him and was just confronting him with scripture itself. Mm -hmm. And I think that that speaks to, I also just had an interview with someone on the authority of scripture, like, and the fact that we're mouths as, as Christians, we are, our job is to proclaim the gospel and to proclaim God's word and to know, like, it's not my opinion, it's God's like, I can, I can give you that. And, and I think there's obviously there, there's a lot to talk about in doing that in a gentle and gracious way. I think you can do it in a, in a not so gracious way. Um, (laughs) And that takes maybe a a special talent or practice or whatever, but um, that's so amazing that she was that for you. And then I think just, yeah, that example of suffering with underlying sustaining power of faith um, is so incredible. I mean, that's, I, I I could say for myself as a Christian, I've seen people, I've seen friends suffer and, um, suffer in a way that doesn't mean that they push the pain away, Mm -hmm. but like, because they believe in Christ, that's what is being proclaimed very quietly and gently through their suffering. And I, and I don't want to make like, um, a to do out of it or anything. I think it's just something that actually happens to Christians, um, because of that, that hope that, we hold on to and that's given to us in Christ, which is yes. really amazing. You know, you kind of wrote throughout the book about this this change and shift that happened slowly over time. And that at first you were less than eager about your husband looking into Christianity and going to church. And, um, and I'm curious what kind of you would say were the the reasons, some of the main reasons you were so hesitant, like what were the things that 
really hadn't clicked into place until that one day on the porch? What were the things that were holding you you back? Um, some of those main those main things or main roadblocks. Um, honestly, I think maybe I had this impending sense that I needed to give up psychedelics, that they weren't good mm. for me, that they were destructive. But like I said, like I said before, I at the same time, I had this kind of Stockholm syndrome. And I, I remember actually, there was a moment, um, and I can't remember now if it was before that, I think it was before that moment on the porch, I'm sure it was before that moment on the porch, when I was listening to it as well with my soul. But I remember feeling like God was saying to me, it's time to let go of acid because acid was always mm -hmm. my my favorite psychedelic it was um really the one that i thought was propelling me toward enlightenment and i remember that moment and i i remember i i wept because and i actually had the thought and i might have even said it out loud that but lsd is my friend that's really mm -hmm. how, how i felt there was almost like this this personification or deification yeah. of, of the drug in my mind. And like I said, that's because I, it, in a way it was, it was my God. And I thought mm -hmm. but this is, even though it was destroying me psychologically and spiritually, I, I felt like I couldn't, I couldn't make that leap into, into faith and into trust and trust that Jesus was the way, the truth and the life. And he <laughs> would take care of me and he would take mm -hmm. me, um, where he wanted me to go. And so I think that was a part of it. I also did still have just that arrogance that, well, also that, that it would have, I, I think I realized it would require me to acknowledge that everything I had done so far was just a heap of filthy rags. Like everything mm -hmm. I had worked so hard at, every yoga practice I had, you know, sweated through, every meditation session that I had, where I had tried to train my, you know, my mind to, to still itself, they they were worthless. They weren't accomplishing yeah. anything, and so I think it was it was hard for me to let go of all this work. But then, like I said, once I turned that corner, it was such a profound relief to let yeah. go of all that. Yeah. So, and there was there was also the piece of humility like i it, i i knew like i i would have to acknowledge that i was a sinner you know like that i was dwelling in a in a body of death that i was yeah. wretched and even though i at the same on one hand i was to a point of desperation there was still that that arrogance and that that pride and that resistance to acknowledging that there was there was really nothing good in me and that and also like I said the, the piece of all these people were onto the truth before I was and that just was was, was a lot so interesting yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah but like I said once I turned the corner on that all those things that I was afraid of actually became a source of of comfort you know of profound hmm. comfort yeah hmm. Yeah, I I mean, I think what you're describing kind of like what in in the circles that I'm in, we would say is like the the law doing its work on you, like all the way to mm. the point where you are at your end. Yeah. And I, I think that what's interesting is that the law can either have that effect of despair or pride. Um, yeah. And really kind of that last that last bit of pride getting chipped away at or whatever is what's necessary a lot of times for our ears and our hearts for the Holy Spirit to come in with the gospel and and give us that that relief and you've said um you've said the word relief so much which I think is so <laughs> true it's so true like that is um I feel like I use the word comfort a lot when I talk about the gospel but I think relief makes so much sense um in these self-salvation schemes and these worldly attempts at kind of like climbing this ladder mm -hmm. to to god is that is that what you're talking about like relief from when you talk about relief can you get can you i guess unpack that word a little bit yeah. Yeah. um yeah absolutely like relief from the burden of trying to save myself 
which yeah. like, it's like, I love that you said like the law doing its work in us. Like, you know, I was not, um, trying to follow God's law, but I was trying to follow a law. Like we talked mm -hmm. about earlier, everyone's following a law of some kind, a code of some kind. And, and it was, it was a heavy burden. Like I was heavy laden and it got heavier and heavier and heavier as I went along. Mm -hmm. And, and because it kept fail, failing and failing and failing, I kept failing and failing and failing. You know, yeah. I failed to live up to my own standards. I failed to attain what, what I thought I was grasping for. I, I, and, and the, the practices failed me, you know, they didn't deliver what, and psychedelics failed me. And, um, yeah, it was just such a, a relief to come to Jesus and sit at his feet and, yeah. you know, find that his yoke is easy and his burden is light and that he is already like his work on the cross is completed for all. Like he has, he has accomplished what I never, I never could. It was yeah. such a profound relief. I thought about, and I still think about Psalm 139 in relation to psychedelics. Like, you know, if I go up to the heights, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. It was hmm. such a comfort to me to realize those horrible trips that I had, those nightmares trips, like Jesus was present. There is no place that I can go in the universe where Jesus, you know, is not there or has not ventured there, has not been there. Yeah. And that was really profound to me because I felt really, there's really like, like I said, because psychedelic trips are very insular and very inward focused. I felt very um, lonely in that, you know, the memory, like there were memories of bad trips that for years afterward, now, now I can think about them. And I, you know, like, cause I said, thank God that he's healed me a lot in those, but I could not even think about those trips without my palms sweating. Like I, oh wow, um, yeah, a bad trip can be horribly, horribly traumatic. And um, there was such, there was, there was such relief in that. There, there was such relief from the the feeling of aloneness or loneliness in my mm. in my burden of knowledge or striving for enlightenment. It was just. Yeah, it was just such a profound relief. I probably yeah. do it, totally abuse that no, word in relation to no, it. No, that's an, yeah, it's amazing. I think it's a, yeah. I think it's the perfect word. Really, I do. I and I think, um, thank you for like unpacking it a little bit more because I think whether people have the exact same experience as you or not, I know people have this experience. We are so we live in a world that's so burdened. We live. Yeah in a we live within this scheme of all these rules and laws which are sometimes very necessary and keep society functioning and people from killing each other those are all sure. good things yeah um but like it's it can feel um so heavy sometimes when we conflate that with our righteousness and our salvation and right. so having the reminder and the the actual word of gospel that takes that away um, mm -hmm. over and over again. What would you say with this whole shift in worldview and, and with, you know, trust in, in Christ, what would you say are some of the main differences that you, you've seen? Um, well, I certainly don't treat people as accessories to my enlightenment anymore, <laughs> which is not, <laughs> of course, it's not to say like, I've learned how to perfectly love my neighbor and love others yeah. and love God, but I think, gosh, one of, I mean, to me, this, the most stark contrast is, is having hope, is having yeah. hope. And, and, um, I think a lot about the verse in Romans five about how, um, suffering produces perseverance and perseverance produces character and character leads to hope and hope does not put us to shame. Mm -hmm. Like just having, having that hope that, um, all of our suffering has a purpose that everything has a purpose and a meaning. Like mm -hmm. a, we, we talked about earlier with pantheism being kind of the other side of the coin of nihilism. Like um, it, it kind of got to the point when I believed all that, that it, nothing really mean anything, nothing really had any yeah. purpose because we're all just going to be absorbed back into the all anyway. And so living with, with meaning is just makes all the difference in the world and the hope that, um, the hope that yes, like the world is, is messed up and there are so many things that are wrong. And there are so many things that are profoundly unjust and, and terrible, but 
but that everything has a purpose and that Jesus is going to be, is going to make everything right. And I think yeah. a lot too about, um, in the Beatitudes, Jesus saying like, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Like I feel that. And I feel like that's, that's part of God planting eternity in the human heart. Like, but I, I felt that in a sense, even back then that, that hunger and thirst for, for rightness and the, that was, that's another big thing that changed the, um, in the, the yoga new age psychedelic circles I ran in, there was this, this belief that the world is, is not really broken, that we are just, Mm -hmm. that we've just been, I remember, uh, I think I might've mentioned this in the book. I can't remember that, um, my yoga teacher at the time, one time she was talking about how like, we're all born these, the, these perfect crystals. And that was a really predominant belief in the new age (laughs) world that we're, that we're all born perfect. And then we get tarnished by the world, by our handlers, Mm -hmm. you know, we get all these fingerprints and dirt on us. And I remember thinking at that time, like, but where, where does the dirt come from? Yeah, where like, does it come from? Yeah, like there's got to be a, an origin point, you know? Yeah. And so so that was also like, it was just amazing to see like all the answers to my, you know, perplexities in the Bible. Like, oh, that's where it comes from. Yeah. Like it is broken. I am broken. There is a fallenness about everything. And be mm. like, oh, that explains it, you know? And so to be able to a- acknowledge that finally, that yes, the world is broken, but we have this very wonderful, great hope in Jesus Christ. Yeah. And so I feel like that that has, and and like you, you kind of said earlier, like I feel like we have to continually be, because of our fallen nature, we have to be continually reminded of the gospel and reminded of what the hope we have is. Yeah. And so, and, um, but but living with that hope is, is just all the difference in the world. Um, I've always, I've always since childhood, even though I didn't know what they were called then, I've always had problems with panic attacks. And I I'll always hmm. wonder, I'll always wonder if, if my use of psychedelics exacerbated that, I think it, hmm. it's probable that it did, but, but even experiencing, and it's not constant, you know, I just have gone through seasons of, of having panic attacks, but but knowing that um, God is with me, God is present with me in that, that I'm not alone, that I don't have to try to heal it myself through yoga or nutrition or crystals, that I don't. And I, I had a friend say to me a few years ago when I was going through a season of, of anxiety and panic attacks, he said, you know, I wonder if Jesus had a panic attack in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I was hmm. like, wow, that was such That's so interesting. a comfort to me. And I don't know, you know, we can't be a hundred percent sure from scripture, yeah. but if he was, I mean, imagining like what he had before him and that he asked the father to take the cup from him and that he was sweating blood. Like it's, I, and that he was both fully human and fully God. I think it's certainly possible that that yeah. was the feelings of terror that he experienced. And so, um, you know, of a magnitude, I'm sure that I, you know, pales or my panic attacks pale in comparison to, but, but it was just, it's such a comfort to me to, to know that. And I think too, I don't know if this is, um, kind of a residue of my, um, new age belief system somehow, but it, it, it has been harder for me to accept, like right away, I could kind of accept like, oh, Jesus was, was fully God but the fully human aspect has actually somehow been, been harder for me to, to wrap my head around, but it's such a great source of comfort. Like yeah. cause he has overcome the world yet. He was fully in the world. He was fully human and fully. Yes. Man. Um, yeah. Yeah, I I was actually going to ask you about that because you have this beautiful passage. I think it's towards the end about, um, G- like not being able to relativize Jesus And the con, like it seems like the incarnation and the concrete, fully human aspect of, um, or reality of Jesus has made quite an impact on you. And it seems like that is probably pretty different than like new age circles stuff. Having with Christianity, like having the simultaneous things be true, like, yes, the world is broken and fallen. It's not at all as it should be. It's not how Mm -hmm. it was originally created. Yet the creation is, is also good. Like Mm -hmm. holding this this paradox and it will be fully redeemed and there will be a new heavens and a new earth. It was 
yeah, it was totally to, and and the idea that Jesus was was fully human, fully God. And I think part of the um the resistance I had, like I said, that I couldn't just toss Jesus into my little grab bag of of different gods that I yeah. you know incorporated into my life before from Hinduism and Buddhism. Um, that he, you know, that I that I wasn't in control anymore too was a big yeah. thing. Like I did not I did not control Jesus. <laughs> like um yeah. And yeah, I think, you know, and I haven't really thought about this that deeply in regards to my new age thing, but I think there is something to the, yeah, the contrast with, with Gnosticism, because I was so ingrained in all these, essentially, essentially in many ways, Gnostic, Gnostic beliefs, and even Mm. something as bodily and physical as yoga, um, like, they'll say, well, the whole purpose of yoga is to train the mind. Like the body isn't really worth much, you know, and even, yeah, that focus on right eating and right, like, it's weird. It's like, on one hand, there's this simultaneous obsession with the body, but there's also this Mm -hmm. evaluation of the body, which is totally also completely different from, from Christianity. And um, yeah, like I said, now I'm really going to be thinking about that. Like, how does that relate to like my difficulty with accepting Jesus as fully human? Like, how does that relate? I think the Gnosticism is probably a big, a big part of it. But like I said there again, I use the word relief again, as a profound relief too, to, to, for it was, you know, it was and is now to, to ref, just to think about the incarnation and just to, to have something to like, you know, it's kind of a cliche in the psychedelic world of a, a, like, I, this phrase might've even originated in the sixties, like about blowing your mind. And so mm-hmm. it was, it was profound to be like, my mind was really blown when I started contemplating like that the Trinity is like the the ground of reality like the foundation hmm. of reality and that jesus is the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end like he was fully god and fully human like and those are things that i still there's like a there's like an eternal i don't know like an eternal resonance in them that and mystery in them and beauty yeah. in them that's the other yeah. thing like the, the beauty of of jesus and who he is was such a contrast from, well, certainly from the, you know, the Hindu icon that I had on my wall, but right. it, the, the, the mystery, the fact that I couldn't, I would read the gospels and read about what he said and what he did. And there was this feeling of, of awe and fear and, and love and mystery. It was just, I had just never encountered anyone like him because there isn't anyone like him, you know? Yeah. The incarnation is so amazing to me because of the fact that it is so concrete. Like it is, I, I, all other world religions are so abstract. They're not, um, you can't prove them. You can't prove them right or wrong. And the fact that you can actually prove Christianity wrong. Like if we, you know, someone dug up Jesus's bones someday, like, is actually pretty incredible in my mind um, because he's coming into time and space. And in doing that, he's, he's, we are not trusting in a system that we can assail to like, he's doing the work here and now, and then handing it over. And you're right. Like that takes, that means we are not in control. That means we don't have a say. Like it takes all of that out of our hands, which I think is really scary. Um, and then there is this other part of it where all of a sudden we are grappling with this paradox of living in a fallen world, but knowing he's come into it and he has done that to redeem it because he loves it. Like, so it is actually good. Like there's all of that at play, which is so interesting. Well, Ashley, thank you so much. This has been amazing. Um, I know the book is coming out. Can you remind me of when it's coming out and where people can find the book and then also follow, I don't know if you have a, um, a place that you write or anything like that, but where can we follow your work and keep, keep up to date with what you're doing? Uh, thank you. Yeah. The book comes out on October 9th, so you can get it through, okay. you can pre-order or buy it through Amazon and then Lux and Press also has it available for order and pre-order and order on their website. And I do have a website. It's just ashleylandy.com. I have to say it's been very neglected since I, <laughs> so I wrote 
the book when I was pregnant with my son, who is now 20 months old. And so my website is severely neglected. There is a blog on there where I have, you know, a number of old pieces um, that I've written. I have not written regularly since I wrote the book, sadly, but I mean, you know how it is with having a baby and then a toddler. Yeah, so, yeah. I get it. I get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I have also a very neglected Instagram page that I used to post, you know, um, somewhat long essays on, but I haven't done that in a while, but you're, anyone is welcome to, if they want yeah. to taste of, you know, my other writing, welcome to, welcome to look those up, but thank you so much. I have really, I've really enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, I'm just really excited for people to hear your story. So appreciate your time. Outside Ourselves is a 1517 podcast and show to learn more about all of our podcasts and shows. Please go to 1517.org forward slash podcasts. We have some great events coming up uh, in the next couple of months. Those should be linked in the show notes of note is, of course, our uh, 1517's biggest conference of the year. Here We Still Stand, which happens at the end of October. Tickets for that are already sold out, but a live stream is always available for free so that you can tune into any of the sessions if you can't make it. So make sure you sign up for that. Keep your eye out as well for our upcoming Advent project, which is completely free. More information should be out soon about that. Thanks as always for listening. I'll see you back here in a couple weeks with our next guest.